Now, in 2001, the UK introduced a limited liability partnership, LLP, and it was conceived in iniquity and born in sin, basically, because it was the, it was the, the big partnerships, Price Waterhouse, Ernst & Young, paid Simmons & Simmons, a big firm of solicitors, over a million pounds to draft an act of parliament in Jersey, the best parliament money can lobby, and they got themselves limita a limited liability partnership why? Because they wanted to limit their liability. Michael Heseltine then read in the newspaper that they're all going to go offshore and said something must be done. And so years later, something was done. Basically, the accountancy profession, black, not blackmailed, coerced the UK government into enacting this. So we got this new beastie. <clears throat> now, it's confusing because legally, an LLP isn't a partnership. That's the first thing the Act says. It's not a partnership. It's a corporate body, so it's got a legal personality independent of its members, so it can own things and contract and do all these things. It's got limited liability, so you can't lose more than you put in. And that's it. You don't even need a written agreement. You know, that's how simple this is, and it costs you 20 quid to set one up. You know, it's rude not to, basically. It's the simplest corporate form ever invented. And people are doing, I call it an open corporate, and it's being put to very interesting uses. Okay? It's not just used by solicitors, although more than half of them now are LLPs. This was what blew me away when I saw it, this transaction <clears throat> about you know, four or five years ago. Nothing to do with me. The Hilton Group wanted to raise development finance in relation to 10 UK hotels, which they had, okay? 350 million pounds they wanted to raise. And conventionally, they could have done it by borrowing. What happens if you don't pay your mortgage? You get repossessed, you've got an overhead. And if your revenues collapse, you're stuck with an overhead and you can have your hotels repossessed. So they didn't do that. Another bright way of doing it is called a sale and leaseback. You sell the freehold, you lease it back. Now, instead of uh, debt and interest, you've got a rental overhead. What happens if you don't pay the rent? You get thrown out of your hotels again. So the intriguing thing for me was that the Hilton didn't do either of those things. What they did was this. They created a partnership. The Hilton Group became what I call the capital user. They used the money. A consortium which was another LLP, these things nest. It's not a parent subsidiary, it's just one is a member of another. A bank put up the money, and these guys didn't put any cash in at all. One was a property developer, one was a hotel specialist, and they basically divvied up the gross income. Like with an income trust, you're getting a piece of the gross. So in a good year, the finances have a good year. In a bad year, the finances have a bad year. And I think the reason they did this was that they saw their income collapse post 9-11 and they didn't want to be stuck with any more overhead than they could actually handle. So this, I saw that and I thought, wow, that's interesting. Pretty sad, actually, but I found that interesting. <laughs> it's the first example I've seen of a capital partnership. This is what I call it, where the user of the capital is in partnership with the provider of capital. I believe, this is my theory, that this may well be an optimal enterprise model. It may be better than anything else out there. And that might be the reason that it's actually emerging and being used. This is how we build up a generic capital partnership. This is the structure I'm talking about. The first thing we do is we take the asset and we stick it into the hands of a custodian. So somebody owns the asset as a custodian. This is normal in the financial services business. The entire institutional share trading business, the shares aren't owned by the institutions, they're owned by custodians, and basically the economic interest gets traded backwards and forwards, but we don't think of it, it's part of the plumbing. So we have a custodian who owns the asset, whatever that is. Investors invest in it, and it could be money, or money's worth, as I call it, Managers put their time in and their expertise in. 
So that's the human capital. And the users make a payment for the use of the capital. This in very simple terms is a generic template. That's a capital partnership. Three years ago, I was showing somebody this, and the guy said, because he was, he was a Muslim, he said, Chris, he said, you do realize that that's called Musharraka, don't you? Uh, uh, no, I thought Musharraka was something you had in, an in, you know, in, a, in a restaurant. But the, the fact is, that is a classic Islamic finance technique. I didn't know that at the time, but a capital partnership is Islamically sound at a very basic level. <clears throat> It enables new forms of equity. Equity shares, proportional shares, not shares of one pound or one euro, but proportional shares. Anybody who's been involved in a partnership knows about proportional shares. As it says, percentages are used in millions of business presentations each day. There you go, I like that. So, you can have proportional shares. These can be bought and sold but never redeemed like you can redeem a share of one pound because you've always got to have 100%, okay? So percentage shares are not redeemable, <clears throat> but they are transferable. Then you've got redeemable units, possibly, which is, you could create a sort of redeemable share, a share redeemable in kilowatt hours, okay? And that's an interesting little item there. That has a value in exchange, but no continuing rights to production. So you can unitize the production of uh, valuable assets. And such units hold their value because they're asset-based on value provided by the issuer. And that's why I was in Iran recently, I was there for 10 days, talking about unitization of oil and natural gas. And it went down a storm. Really interesting rather than being deficit based upon a claim over value issued by a bank. If I go into a bank and say, here's my 10 pound note, I'll get another 10 pound note back. But the idea is that you could go in somewhere with a, here's a certificate and you can actually use it to pay for something of value as opposed for another certificate. <clears throat>